Hey, jackass, where's my DoorDash? I don't know. DoorDash had a problem. As their cloud-native environment scaled and developers delivered new features, their monitoring system did what monitoring systems do and kept breaking down. In an organization where data is used to make better decisions about technology and about the business, losing observability means the entire company loses their competitive edge. With Chronosphere, DoorDash is no longer losing visibility into their application suite. What's the key? Chronosphere is an open source, compatible, scalable, and reliable observability solution that gives the observability lead at DoorDash business confidence and peace of mind. To learn more, read the full success story at snark.cloud slash chronosphere success. I recently revisited my dedicated last tweet in AWS free threading Twitter client to help users of that ridiculous shit posting app solve some latency issues when they were far away. The client's always been pretty zippy for me, but it's been hosted out of US West 2 in Oregon and I'm in San Francisco, mostly. When some friends went to conferences in Europe, I immediately facepalmed. Of course it's going to be slow for them. A careful study showed that AWS does in fact offer services in more than one geographic region. I concocted the harebrained idea to not only revisit and slightly modernize the application stack, but also to deploy this thing to every commercial AWS region simultaneously. It turns out that this would later be known as a bad idea. It made sense to deploy last tweet in AWS to multiple regions. After all, the Twitter client that lives at last tweet in AWS.com is completely stateless, aside from a couple of API credentials that get set as Lambda environment variables at deploy time. It's just a DNS record, an API gateway, and an omnibus Lambda function that houses an express application. Now, this of course meant that Lambda at Edge was a complete non-starter, which is fine because that service is complete garbage. If you disagree with me, then ask yourself why AWS launched CloudFront functions instead of fixing something that was so irredeemably awful. I digress. Historically, I built and deployed this thing via the serverless framework. After some users discovered serverless playing fast and loose with their AWS credentials and then not telling them about it, I figured that maybe I didn't want to be using that anymore. I researched some alternatives and decided to spend a day building this thing out via the AWS Cloud Development Kit, which put my last experience with the CDK to good use. This time, I went with TypeScript, a language like JavaScript that I had no real prior experience with to the point where I didn't realize when I started that TypeScript is just a subset of JavaScript. Oops. I'm used to using things that I have a lot more experience with, such as, you know, shitty Python. Despite the often challenging obstacles that the CDK threw my way, I enjoy the experience enough that this is likely to be my tool of choice for future AWS projects. You can tell that I succeeded. If you visit lasttweetinaws.com, the footer at the bottom of the page lists what region it's being served out of. I'm kind of proud of that. That said, this was still an AWS project, and as a result, there were some incredibly sharp edges. I will now enumerate them. If you go to the AWS Regional Services list, it says that API gateways are available in basically all regions, including both Jakarta, Indonesia, and Osaka, Japan. Given that I was modernizing this entire stack away from the serverless framework, it made sense to go with AWS's new V2 HTTP API offering. In addition to being absolutely impossible to search Google for as a term, an HTTP API is not supported in either the Jakarta or Osaka regions. At the very least, this deserves an asterisk in that regional services listing before I get to discover it myself mid-project. Very similarly, I originally wanted this Lambda function to run under AWS's Graviton2 ARM architecture. The joke's on me! ARM-based Lambda functions are only available in a subset of regions, 
to figure out which ones, you get to go spelunking into old blog posts, as AWS loves to play hide and seek with this kind of caveat. There are two API credentials that I wanted the application to have, and I didn't want to bake them into the code for obvious reasons. Parameter stores secure string values are unsupported in CloudFormation without some gnarly caveats, and all of the documentation pushes you towards using AWS Secrets Manager instead because that one isn't free. With two secrets in 20 regions at 40 cents a piece, I was somewhat unwilling to pay AWS $16 a month just to juggle two secrets for me. So I decided to hell with this, and I built out an S3 bucket containing an object that just had those credentials stored in JSON. Getting TypeScript to retrieve those properly as part of the CDK stack was not only challenging, it was also the single biggest obstacle to overcome. Hey, that's a promise object, not a string, that le led to a variety of documentation that presupposed I knew what the hell those words meant. Because of course I was already conversant with the joy that is TypeScript and its ecosystem, or else I wouldn't be here, right? Guess, check, scream with rage, depend upon a community member named Eric Tucker to be unreasonably generous with his time, and eventually solve it via brute force was the single most off-putting part of this entire process. The CDK clearly needs a better story around semi-sensitive secret storage. The far easier path for me would have been to just hard code the creds into the code itself. Yuck, don't do that, but I understand why you would. The documentation for the CDK is rich and deep, but it was clearly written by folks who are themselves very familiar with both the TypeScript language and the CDK itself. You wouldn't think that this was going to be an issue, but the problem that invariably creeps in is the implicit assumption that the reader knows as much as the documentation author. If that were the case, would I really be there reading the docs? Here's a good rule of thumb. After you write documentation, have someone who is intelligent yet unfamiliar with the problem domain read it to make sure that what you've authored is understandable for folks who are not you. Do you really think that this video wasn't reviewed by a professional editor before I published it just to make sure that it's coherent? AWS loves talking about regions. It became incredibly clear that despite having 20 or so usable regions for this project, nothing AWS builds ever really envisions a customer using even a majority of them. There's no support and basically no community documentation for here's how to deploy an application to every AWS region, because it's apparently something that nobody does without a whole mess of either homegrown or third-party tooling to assist them. I felt like I was breaking an awful lot of new ground here, and that's usually a red flag that you're doing something very wrong. In this case, I was fully aware of my trailblazing across regions, but it was still unsettling. The way that this ridiculous application load balances traffic to the nearest region is ridiculously simple. It uses a Route 53 latency-based routing policy to return the region that's the closest to the user who requests it. A thorough search throughout the CDK and CloudFormation documentation revealed so few references to latency records that I started to wonder if I'd imagined the entire thing in a fever dream. Turns out the joke's on me. If you specify all of the stuff you need for a variety of those routing policies, but don't explicitly choose one of the other routing options, latency-based is the default choice. I'm not sure I could have made this less obvious if you had paid me to obfuscate it intentionally. Yowza! AWS has an entire CDK pipeline pattern slash model that's available, mostly as a joke. I looked into it, had a hearty laugh, and of course went with GitHub Actions for my auto deployments instead. This is too far up the stack of developer experience for me to have any confidence whatsoever that AWS's offerings weren't going to cut me to ribbons with edge cases. A quick straw poll in the cdk.dev Slack team reaffirmed this position. 
use GitHub Actions or prepare for pain was the clear consensus. GitHub Actions has matrix jobs and they made it an absolute pleasure to build this thing out. I gave it a list of AWS regions in the GitHub workflow YAML file, referenced it in the build job, and it just worked. Until it crosses over 3,000 minutes a month of build time, it's also completely free, and my code of course already lives in GitHub already. One problem that I noticed was that once I used up those 3,000 monthly free minutes within GitHub Actions, every deploy was going to cost me another 36 cents. That's not a lot of money to be sure, but it means that sloppy one-line typoed commits, because I have no idea how software testing works, start to add up. I attempted to run a local runner on top of my Oracle Cloud free tier VM, but it turns out the 21 concurrent node processes just beat the ever-loving snot out of most virtual machines. I then shoved a Docker image into a Lambda function to act as the runner, and that mostly worked, but after that was done, I discovered that Cloud Snorkel's implementation via the CDK is way more elegant than my monstrosity, and even supports Fargate. So if you're viewing this as some sort of horrible how-to guide, go use that instead. This one isn't entirely on AWS. I don't know how to fix it responsibly unless I get to also smack Google around a bit too. Whenever I searched for a particular problem, the CDK documentation was one of the first results. This is good. Unfortunately, I was greeted at the top of every page with a warning that I was looking at the version one documentation, which went end of support as of June 1st, 2022. This is bad. They're close, but they're not identical. And it becomes low key frustrating to have to consistently click an extra link to get to the actual answers instead of the plausibly correct, but subtly wrong version. Speaking of version issues, if you have a CDK construct or library that's a different version than the CDK itself, all hell is going to break loose. I'm not talking about V1 versus V2, but rather 2.24.0 versus 2.25.0 here. Remove the or newer option in your package lock JSON file if you value your sanity, because the version bumps come pretty frequently. I dread having to maintain this thing after 18 months or so of not touching it, but that's the best kind of problem, future Corys, because screw that guy. AWS's own CDK best practices guide starts by talking about how to set up an organization-wide cloud center of excellence, you know, as opposed to what, their data center of mediocrity? Now that is, to be direct, complete horseshit. People look for best practices to answer one key driving question. What should I avoid doing now that's an easy decision to make, but is going to haunt me in six months if I don't make the right choice now? People reaching for a tool like the CDK for the first time are not thinking about sweeping transformational org change. They're trying to figure out what their project structure should look like, what idioms exist that they can take advantage of, and where to go to find help. Instead, this page avoids most of those, opting instead to give advice like, infrastructure and application code live in the same package. No, they shouldn't. That's a blatant attempt to undo the entire last decade of DevOps evolution, and once again, breach the divide between what's inside of the container and how you're gonna manage it externally. No. Stop it. Stay in your overly complicated lane with its bad naming conventions. I will call out something rather well designed about Route 53 latency records. Each stack controls its own record instead of there being one single omnibus record that needs to be shared between each regional stack and somehow juggle state for failed stack deploys and whatnot. That was a remarkably forward-looking idea and a pleasant surprise to encounter. I'm very impressed by my favorite database. The rest of my explorations went about like you'd expect. It took a bit of work to get OICD working responsibly with GitHub so I didn't have to give it long-term IAM credentials, but I did ultimately succeed. I still hate JavaScript promises, async await, and the way that they make me feel, like I don't know how computers are supposed to work. I think the CDK is a great interface for a certain type of developer. And I further believe that that type of developer is very much the future of cloud. Gold star on that one. 
There's still no great way to teach an HTTP API to just offer a redirect to its TLS version on port 80, and subdomain redirects remain as obnoxiously annoying as they always have. But on balance, it's now way easier for me to quickly write live post tweet threads regardless of where on the planet I am.